Okay. okay. All right. Um, see, I'm going to stop showing my video. Uh, I've got a number of cats, and sometimes they like to walk in front of screens or jump on my head. So. Oh, can you hear me now? Everybody okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just saying I'm gonna stop sharing my uh, personal screen of myself just in case any of my cats jump on my head or, or start walking in front of the screen. But I think everybody should be able to see the, the PowerPoint there. Um, yeah, so um, like she said, I'm Brandon Bassett. I've worked with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission since 2007. Um, during that time, I've knee crop seed uh, approximately almost 3,000 manatees, um, done rescues on, I think, around 400 manatees. Um, and no matter how much we do, there's always something interesting that we find. Um, the job has never gotten old for me and enjoy doing it quite a bit. Um, so as a little disclaimer here, Let's see if it comes through. Oops, too far. There we go. Okay. Um, so I've tried to keep, you know, pictures of bloody stuff to a minimum, but this is a talk about dead manatees. And so you are going to see that from time to time um, and a little bit of blood here and there, but hopefully it's not too much for everybody. If it is, just kind of look away until the next slide. And then, uh, I guess I'll just go through the whole presentation and uh, if you guys have questions at the end, I'll answer questions for as long as you like. Um, it doesn't have to be just about manatee necropsies. It can be anything manatee related because I can talk about manatees for hours. Uh, no problem at all. All right, so to start with, I just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of where the authority comes from to work with manatees. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has ultimate authority over manatees in the United States. Um, they give us the authority to then work with the manatees. And they have designated the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission as the organization to run the manatee carcass salvage and necropsy program. We also um, are very heavily involved in the manatee rescue program. There are other entities around the state that can rescue manatees like SeaWorld, um, the Crystal River Refuge, but it's very rare that any rescues happen in Florida if, without some sort of FWC involvement. Um, let's see, there are also currently, I guess, there's been some changes, but there are three active rehab centers in the state and then a number of secondary sites for manatees as well. Uh, currently, SeaWorld, Zoo Tampa, and Jacksonville are the, the active ones who can take manatees at the moment. All right, so to kind of help us manage this large workload, we have split the state into a number of different regions. Uh, the red region you see there, covered by the MMPL, is the region that I work in. Um, it might look like we got the short end of the stick there with so much territory, but we also have the most staff. Uh, we have seven full-time and one part-time position. And usually we don't get too many calls north of Citrus or Levy County. Um, although there have been times where we've had to drive all the way up to Pensacola for a, a dead manatee. Let's see. So whenever uh, somebody finds a dead manatee, they can call the wildlife alert hotline and that will go to our law enforcement dispatch regions. And then those dispatch regions are um, on the screen there, the, the large highlighted regions, our black highlighted regions are the different dispatch regions. And when they get the call, they'll send it to the right field station. So if you're in you know, Levy County, you may get the Northeast law enforcement dispatch region, but they will call us and at the MMPL and then we will call you back. So the Citizen reporting is the primary way that we get reports of dead manatees. Occasionally, our law enforcement officers on the water may find something. Um, other organizations like the Coast Guard might find a manatee, but um, I'd say probably 95% of all the dead manatees we get reports from are from the public. So uh, once we get a report, um, 
we want to verify it. We really want to be very cautious about assigning carcass numbers. Um, I think everybody probably realizes that manatees can be a very political um, hot topic, especially with things like speed zones, um, things like that. And so we don't want to want to inflate the numbers. So we need to have a photo of a manatee. One of our staff needs to see it or a trusted partner like a law enforcement officer or somebody from like say Clearwater Marine Aquarium, moat, that sort of thing. Let's see. Um, hang on one moment. My cat is walking in front of my screen. Okay, there we go. All right. So sometimes we get calls of things that um, we think are manatees. For instance, here, we got a call from a couple who said that there's a manatee stuck in a culvert. And if you look there on the kind of middle left side, it looks like there's a manatee tail coming out of that culvert. Um, they even went down there and tried to pull the manatee out, but they said it was stuck tight because of the tides. So we called some of our um, partners up at Gulf World and they went back out uh, at low tide to see if they could get the manatee out or try to get better view of what was going on. And this is what they found. Not a manatee, but a rubber uh, cover to keep manatees out of the culvert. See, in a, another case, we got a call of a dead manatee that a uh, lady claimed somebody had chopped its tail off. You can see here, uh, if you look closely there on the left, it kind of looks like it's very red and bloody. And maybe, you know, that could be a vertebrae in the center right there. However, that was just a manatee mailbox. We got another call um, of a dead manatee floating behind a person's house. And really decomposed dead manatees look just like this. They get white, they get flat. However, that just turned out to be an inflatable raft. So we get calls like this all the time. So we have to be very careful, as I said, and verify all the calls we get. Um, one of my favorites was we got a call of a, a dead manatee with a um, baby manatee that was swimming around it. Um, get somebody out there. Turns out the dead adult manatee was just a couch and the baby was just a couch cushion floating beside it. All right, so once we have confirmed that we've got a dead manatee, most of the time we wanna to try to get out there and collect as much information as is feasible. To kind of help us out with that, we've designed uh, some of these special carcass trailers. Uh, we really don't use the flatbed style anymore because they're, they're kind of hard to cover um, they can be a little hard to use, but these U trailers, which you see on the bottom and the left hand side, are very handy. Uh, if we can get a carcass to a boat ramp, we just back that trailer down into the water, float the manatee in, and then off we go. It's easy to cover it, so nobody has to look at it. Um, hopefully, nobody has to smell it. And then we can uh, load multiple manatees into those if we need to. Um, sometimes, however, there's uh, no boat ramps nearby. It might be really remote, um, or there may be no officers available to tow it. In those cases, we've got um, some other options. One is called the Easy Lift. It's a little crane that folds out of the back of our trucks. Um, they have about a 2,000 pound capacity on them, so we can get some very large manatees. One person can go out and collect this manatee, whereas before, um, it would take multiple people to try to get something like that into a truck. So once we've got the manatee, um, generally a majority of those manatees come to our lab at the Marine Mammal Pathobiology Lab. Uh, we are located in Pinellas County at the, the southern tip. Uh, we re lease a little bit of land off of Eckerd College. And this opened up back in the mid nineties. Um, we just recently celebrated our 25 year anniversary, I think just before the pandemic started. But we started out with three staff and the lab would process about 115 manatees a year. Um, this year we've got, as I said, eight staff and we've had over a thousand dead manatees so far this year, where I think about 1,044 as of today. Um, and I, I'll kind of mention it a little bit more in a minute, but we don't process all of those carcasses anymore. It's just too many. Uh, we've tried it in the past. For instance, in 2010, when we had a lot of cold snaps, it killed off uh, about 766 manatees, I think. And we tried to get every one of those to the lab. And we were necropsying 
12 to 16 manatees a day, uh, working 10 hours a day, seven days a week for weeks at a time. And, you know, doing that burns people out and it's just, it's very difficult. So we've adjusted kind of what we do a little bit nowadays. But the, the most manatees we've ever necropsied in one day was 19. We had, uh, I think, four or five different teams going at the same time to process all of those. Let's see. Okay. Um, so because we are a state agency tasked with uh, monitoring the, the manatee populations, most of what we do is geared towards that management. Um, we don't do a lot of research just for pure research sake. Um, it needs to have some kind of component towards keeping track of manatees health, the population, things like that. Um, a lot of the information we get can feed into determinations of whether speed zones need to be added, removed, maintained. Um, if somebody breaks the law, sometimes our findings can be used in uh, lawsuits. For instance, there was a guy who um, on the other side of the state was repeatedly breaking speed zones and his neighbors were getting pretty fed up with it. And then one day a neighbor saw him blowing through the, the slow speed zone and saw him hit a manatee. And then that manatee was found dead just a short time later. We were able to provide law enforcement with the necropsy findings and they took him to court and um, actually confiscated his boat as, as well as I think some other fines. Um, so whenever we do these things, we need to be very sure of our causes of death. Um, if anything is going to go to court, it needs to be defensible. We need to be able to back up everything we, we put down. Um, and along those lines, we never want to assume anything because as I'll show you, you know, looks can be deceiving. But while we're doing all of this stuff for management, we also collect other stuff uh, for some research for ourselves, but also research for partners. Um, morphometrics, which is all the, the body measurements, um, scar photos, any live manatee we get our hands on, we'll put uh, microchips um, in their shoulders. It's the same sort of microchips that you put in cats and dogs, and genetics and other kind of tissue samples. Let's see, so uh, I think some of this is, is kind of repeating what I just said. Um, yep, so uh, once a necropsy is done, if it's at the lab, then we'll have a rendering company come out and, and take the parts away. But a lot of manatees are necropsied out in the field. They don't all have to come actually to the lab. And some of those um, will just leave to decompose naturally in, the, um, in nature or others that we'll take out to be disposed of. All right, so to help, help management um, deal with all of this, we've got nine death categories. These are not necessarily causes of death, but just categories that we lump the manatees into. See watercraft, uh, water control structures, which are floodgates or canal locks, um, other human related issues, which may be you know, fishing line, hooks, poaching. Uh, perinatal is a category that we lump newborn or stillborn calves into. Um, that's any manatee that's just under five feet long. Um, cold stress, Natural other, which includes everything that's not cold stress, basically, uh, includes red tides, things like that. Um, verified not necropsied, undetermined to decomposed, and undetermined other. So watercraft is a pretty big one. That's uh, almost every year, that's the highest human-related cause of death that we have. Um, injuries can be impact-related, which may only leave very small visible wounds on the outside, or they can be propeller related. But the majority of deaths from watercraft come from impact wounds. Um, in addition to the, those types of wounds, you can also have acute and chronic injuries. Acute means the animal died within about 48 hours of being struck, whereas chronic is an animal that might live weeks, months, or we've even seen animals survive for years with chronic injuries before they finally succumb to them. But just because we get a carcass that has fresh or healing or chronic watercraft wounds, that doesn't mean that's why the manatee died. Um, you know, 96% of all adult manatees have hit, been hit at least once in their lives and survived it. Um, on average, they are hit seven or eight times in their lives, but 
And we've seen manatees that have been struck, you know, 30, 40 or more times in their lives and survived, um, yeah, basically survived all of those strikes. So just because we see one with wounds, we can't assume that. We've got to actually do the necropsy before we can determine the cause of death. So some of the things that we look for are signs of pre-mortem trauma. It means bruising, hemorrhaging, things like that. Um, on the photo on the right-hand side, uh, we've kind of pulled the, the skin back a little bit. You can see that the white mark there is the fresh watercraft wound. And under that, you can see there's a lot of bruising um, and hemorrhaging there in the muscle. So that tells us that the manatee was alive when it got struck. Sometimes, um, you know, manatees that are dead float at the surface and they'll get hit after they died. So if we don't have any of these indications of premortem trauma, then we're not going to call it a watercraft death. Um, sometimes you'll get uh, organ damage. For instance, photo on the left, the top is a, a decent looking kidney. The bottom kidney has been damaged pretty badly and is surrounded by a lot of blood clots. Uh, the floodgate canal lock. Uh, these days, it's not a, a huge category. Uh, that's because we've installed a lot of manatee protection devices. Um, those devices generally, lurk, generally work pretty well, but sometimes things get biofouled, you know, systems break. Um, there are some structures that don't have those protection devices. So anytime we find a carcass near a structure, we always try to bring that one in so we can try to determine whether the structure killed it. And if so, how and how can we prevent it from happening again? Um, Sometimes these structures have logs that will give us in a, either a graphical form or a chart form, the raising and lowering of the gates. So we can kind of pinpoint exactly when that manatee might've been crushed um, or impinged up against the gate. And sometimes the wounds are, are not very clear, but sometimes they're very clear and you can even have bolt impressions or other things like that. So uh, talk about floodgates a little bit first. So in general, floodgates are used to control water levels um, upstream of the structure. Uh, they can be used to control salinity levels. Um, if you've got a, a lock where you want one side of the river to be higher than the other, then this is a good way to control that water flow. Um, these deaths at these structures happen either because manatee tries to swim through as it's closing and gets pinned and crushed. Or if the gate's cracked open a little bit, there's so much water suction that the manatee gets too close, they get stuck against it. So to prevent that, um, some structures have these grates, as you can see right there, and that prevents the manatees from getting too close to them. Um, canal locks, uh, if you have never heard of a, a canal lock before, you basically have a higher water level on one side than the other. So a boat will come into the, the chamber, water level will rise, and then the other doors will open and the, mat, or the uh, boat will leave out the other side. Um, manatees actually have learned how to use these things and they will sit on one side of that lock structure and wait for the lock tenders to open the gates. And the lock tenders actually have special instructions that if they see manatees waiting to go through, they tell the boaters to wait, pass the manatees through, and then they pass the boaters through. And these sorts of structures have acoustic protection devices to prevent manatees from getting crushed. But as I said, you know, occasionally things fail, unexpected things happen. Occasionally manatees get back inside the uh, structure doors as well in this um, kind of recess space. There's screens that are supposed to keep them out, but you know, in the saltwater environment, metal doesn't last all that long. So sometimes they do still get behind there. So this is just a little video. I'll see if it, uh, the bandwidth plays it or not. So this is the, uh, the floodgate. So you can see the left door is closed. The right door is open. Those gates don't close very fast. They only close at a rate of about six inches per minute. So about one inch every 10 seconds. Um, so you might wonder, you know, how do manatees actually get stuck there if it's closing so slowly? Part of it may be because as it closes, the water pressure is so strong that the manatee can't get through and is like swimming as 
as fast as it can, is stuck into the water pressure and then gets caught. Um, sometimes manatees have learned that, well, let me back up a moment. So to prevent this sort of crushing death, these have pressure sensor switches along the bottoms of the doors, but they're not just a strictly pressure release sensor, they're an impact pressure sensor. So if a manatee's under there and it bumps it, then the door will stop and open immediately. And manatees have learned that if they swim up to that as it's closing, they can bump it with their head and make it go back up. And we've had people in the field say that it looks like they some of them have made a game out of it. They'll just kind of hang around there and it starts closing to go up there and they'll bump it and make it go back up. And then next time it closes, they'll go and bump it again. And you know, that's a dangerous game to play because if you get in the wrong spot and you don't bump that sensor right, you get caught. The other way is impingement. That's where you have um, the doors just cracked open a little bit. To prevent this sort of death, um, they either have screens to keep the manatees away or they have um, special operating procedures. These sorts of gates are never supposed to be held between um, say six inches and two feet because that half foot six inch range is generally a, the kill range that we see manatees get sucked up on the doors like this. Um, even though we have those operating procedures out to all the um, floodgate operators, you know, there's turnover, people may not get their training right away, people forget their training, and they start operating these gates at the wrong openings. So whenever we find something near one of these gates, we definitely want to figure out right away you know, why it dies so we can correct it and prevent it from happening again. And just a, a few pictures of kind of what that looks like. Now, this looks pretty obvious, a uh, very square looking mark on the manatee. Um, watercraft don't make impressions like that. Um, a lot of times you'll find evidence of drowning as well. Um, yeah. um, here's another photo. This is a manatee that was uh, sucked up against a floodgate and you can actually see the six headed hexagonal bolt head impressions on the manatee right there. So that one was pretty obvious. Um, and then as I said, um, let's see. Yeah, this is a, a kind of a repeat of what I've said already. So one of the reasons, or just give you another example of um, why it's important to determine these causes of death as quickly as possible. Uh, back in 2012, we had a dead manatee found just downstream of a series of floodgates and then the next day there's another and two days later there was another and we figured out pretty quick that something was going on because each time we necropsied them within about 24 hours of them being called in we found out that it, they were from impingement against the floodgates um well we were able to get our managers to call them real fast and figure out what was going on what turned out to happen was a couple of months before they were removing a protection screen because there was too much vegetation on it, but they did it incorrectly and they broke the concrete wall. Well, instead of changing their operating procedures or even letting us know about it, they just tossed the protection screen onto the shoreline and just went on with their business. And because there was no protection screen on that floodgate, when manatees started moving through for the winter, one after another, they started getting sucked up against it. We ended up having five manatees die in an eight day period at that point. But we were at least able to figure out what was going on quickly and get them to stop operating that gate until they got the issue fixed. All right, um, so the human other, kind of a, a catch all for everything else. Um, we don't get too many like ingestion or entanglement deaths, but they do happen from time to time. Animals get stuck in culverts. Uh, as you can see that top right photo, that manatee passed through the culvert without any problem, but another manatee actually got stuck in that and drowned a couple of years later. Um, you know, there's probably tens of thousands of culverts in Florida, but whenever we find one that's a problem, uh, we try to work with the city or the county to get a, a, a screen of some sort put over it so manatees can't get through anymore. Um, poaching is something we really don't have to deal with these days. Uh, I don't think we've had a confirmed poaching case in a couple of decades. Um, 
but yeah, entanglements are live entanglements are a very high reason for rescues, as you can see in those bottom three photos. Um, just to kind of give you a, an idea of foreign debris problems, about 12% of the manatees that we necropsy have some sort of foreign debris in their GI tract, uh, whether it's fishing line, which is the most common, or plastics or other things. Um, there's a, a very wide variety of weird things that we found inside manatees. Um, I've even found a couple of condoms in their GI tract, um, plastic gloves. Uh, I think we found little shards of, of metal. There's lots of weird stuff. However, only about 2% of those manatees died from actually eating that debris. So that's another reason or another example of why we have to um, have evidence and be sure of what our necropsy findings are um, because you know, plastics in the environment is a really big issue these days. And just because there's something in there, even if it's causing some sort of GI irritation, we can't say that's what killed it unless we can back that up. Um, one extreme example is that bottom right photo there on the right hand side, that is a giant wad of plastic bags. And then that's kind of like a, a string of plastic bag that then connects to that smaller ball of plastic bag. So that big one on the right was in the stomach. And then the rest of this was in the small intestine. And it caused the small intestine to kind of bunch up like an accordion. Um, maybe a little hard to tell, but the small intestine wall was hemorrhagic. There are lots of necrotic areas. And obviously, if you've got that much plastic blocking your stomach, you're not going to be eating. Um, but thankfully, we don't see stuff like that all that often these days. All right, um, as I said, perinatal is kind of a catch-all for very small um, or stillborn calves. Uh, we don't necropsy these as often anymore just because our managers have determined that um, through our core biological model that the perinatals don't, they don't contribute to the, I'm mean, trying try to word this right, the dead perinatals don't contribute information to the core biological model for managing the population. Um, we wanna know where they're at. Uh, occasionally we'll necropsy them just to keep track of the, the health of the population. Um, if they're stillborn, like obviously stillborn, that the placenta is still attached, that's important information. But in the past, we've put enormous amounts of energy into collecting and necropsying these, and they just really don't provide the management information that we need. So these days, as I said, we don't necropsy nearly as many of them. Uh, cold stress can be a pretty big problem for manatees. Uh, if they're exposed to water temperatures below 68 degrees for an extended period of time, they'll start to get immunosuppressed. They'll stop eating. They'll start to get sores on their faces and their body. They might develop abscesses, and they'll just generally get emaciated. If they're exposed to water temperatures in the low 50s or the 40s, they can die from acute hypothermia, basically. Um, so we want to kind of keep track of what's going on with the, the water quality of where they live. And one way of doing that is keeping track of the cold stress deaths. Uh, this photo is at the uh, Tampa's Manatee Viewing Center. If you don't know about it, you can go there and see manatees in the wintertime using those warm water outlets. So some of the external signs that we see of cold stress are these uh, sores or lesions on the face, um, on the tail there. Uh, that top center photo is very thickened um, and red epidermis. Uh, that bottom photo is a emaciated manatee belly. It's just, there's nothing in its GI tract, so the belly's kind of caved in a bit. Some of the stuff that um, we deal with there. Um, internally, uh, a lot of abscesses. You can see in that top photo. The bottom left photo is a small intestine. You can see it's just very hemorrhagic. Um, when they get immunosuppressed, parasites or fungus or virus may take over. And then uh, they just use up their fats, which it may not be real clear, but that right side, instead of a, a really nice consistency of fat, their fat turns very serious and watery as they continue to use it and get emaciated. And then uh, the natural other categories, another just kind of catch-all category, uh, includes red tide, infectious diseases, um, dystocia. Uh, sometimes manatees will get tidally stranded 
whether during mating herds or at other times. Um, and then natural entrapments. And there's a, a wide variety of things that manatees can get in trouble with. Uh, they're very curious, but they do get themselves into trouble. So red tide's been in the, the news quite a bit lately. Um, so some of the, the issues with red tide is it's a neurotoxin. Um, so when people breathe it, it causes respiratory irritation, but manatees get in trouble because that brevitoxin settles on the seagrass and then they eat the seagrass and get a massive dose of it. Um, once they get disoriented because of the neurotoxin, they usually end up drowning because they don't know which way is up. Um, the, the red tide toxin also messes with the um, blood coagulation. So we will get very bloody organs. Um, you can see those photos of the, the bloody eyes and all the fluid and foam from the nose. Um, but generally, if we can get to a manatee before it drowns, I'd say we've probably got a 95% chance that that manatee can be saved and then released again. Uh, verified not necropsy. In years past, that's been a, a relatively small category. It includes animals that um, we got a picture of, but maybe it was really remote and you know, may not be worth driving three hours and then boating four hours just to get to a carcass that has no organs left. Um, sometimes we get fresh animals that get called in and we get a photo of it and then it's never seen again. You know, maybe it floated out into the Gulf or the Atlantic or maybe shark scavenging got it, but we at least have some record of it. Um, these days we've got a, a, what we call a quota system where we kind of pick and choose animals a little bit more carefully so that we don't have to necropsy a thousand manatees a year. Um, but even if we don't do a full necropsy on all of them, we try to get out and collect some level of information from every carcass that we can. Um, generally that'll include a full set of photos, genetics, measurements on the animals. We might just open it up to see what the inside looks like, see if it's emaciated, see what the stomach contents look like, stuff like that. Um, and just kind of give you, let's see, oh, that's the next slide. Um, yeah, I think I said all of that. So kind of give you a little bit of an idea of, um, of what we've been doing this year. Uh, you may or may not have heard about the, the starvation mortality event that's going on in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, because of repeated algal blooms that have been fueled by um, various things in the water, those algal blooms have killed off the seagrass over the course of about 10 years or so. So now there's very little in the Indian River Lagoon for manatees to eat, which is why we've had so many die this year. Um, but let's see, through August 6th, um, we've had 317 dead manatees just in Brevard County alone. Um, of those 317, we were able to fully necropsy 62 of them. 155 received a full external workup which like I said, includes photos, pit tag scanning, genetics, morphometrics. And then another 16 of them received at least some level of partial workup. So of those 317, um, almost 75% of them were responded to and got worked up, even though we only fully necropsied 62 of them. And that's just Brevard County. If you consider that we only have three manatee staff covering um, half of Volusia County through Indian River County, so that's two and a half counties. This is all their responsibility. And these are just the dead manatees in one county. So there'd be no way that they could necropsy everything that came in. So we feel like this is a good way to kind of get a snapshot of what's going on and keep track of the health of the, health of the population. Uh, see the undetermined 2D composed category, a little self-explanatory maybe, it's just very decomposed, there may not be any organs left. Um, but in general, we can't figure out why the manatee died because of the level of decomposition. Um, in the summertime, that's a number is a lot higher than the wintertime because as some of you may have noticed, Florida is a little warm in the summer. So you know things decompose rather quickly. Um, in the wintertime, we get more fresh animals 
and the undetermined other category um, generally is not very large, but those are fresher animals that we look at. And for whatever reason, we just can't see any reason why the manatee died. We do get those from time to time and it's a bit of a mystery. All right, um, so I don't know if uh, you want me to just dive right into a couple of case studies or if there's any questions up to this point. Um, I think we're fascinated. If you don't mind, keep talking. We, we're loving it. Okay. All right, so the, the first case that I'll talk about, um, a number of years back, we had two manatee carcasses reported on the same day in a golf course pond in Crystal River. Um, it looked like it was going to be a mom-calf pair, a very large female and a smaller male. Um, but a little bit of history on this pond before I start getting into it a lot. In the past, manatees had no access to this pond. However, after uh, was it hurricane, uh, I forget the name of the hurricane, um, one came through. I think it was Hurricane Hermine. Hermine, okay, Hurricane Hermine um, got a lot of flooding in the area and manatees were able to swim over this small dam and get into that pond. And then nine of them got stuck in there when the water went back out again. So we had to go in there and spent two days catching all these manatees out of this pond, huge ordeal. Um, and then a couple of years later, we had a tropical storm come through and several more manatees got stuck in there. So there's already kind of a history of manatees getting stuck in this pond. Well, a couple of years after that second time, another storm came through that ended up washing most of that dam away, which then gave manatees free access to this pond. However, they only had access at high tide and at low tide, if they were still in there, they had to stay there till the tide came, came back up again. But it was no issue because the pond was deep enough for them to be in there without any problem. But every time that would happen, we would get calls from people who said that the manatees were stuck in the pond and they were going to die if we didn't come and get them out immediately. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of heightened awareness for the residents around there from this. Um, let's see, so I'll get into this case a little more now. So to give you kind of a layout there, at the top left, that's the creek that comes down to the, the dam or, or weir, um, kind of the same thing. And then the pond there on the right is where they got in. And then there's a couple of culverts through here. Uh, the culvert there on the bottom left got washed out, oh, excuse me, got washed out with the same storm that damaged the weir, but it had killed manatees in the past from them swimming in and getting stuck. Then we got two other culverts in here and when we were rescuing manatees out of this pond previously, the manatees were swimming back and forth through these two culverts. So it didn't seem like those were really any, any issue. However, the two manatees, which you can see in that bottom left photo, were found by this Western culvert. And by the time our biologist got up there three hours later, the smaller manatee had floated through that culvert and the larger manatee was sitting halfway in the culvert. So it seemed very suspicious that they would be right there. So we collected them both, brought them to our lab. This is the large female. And um, you can see the drawings of all the, the scratches that it had there on the right. Um, the whole body was just covered in um, kind of bloody scratches. But what we noticed was, if you look closely at the, the bottom drawing, there were bands of parallel scrapes that were mostly evenly spaced, which is very interesting. And then on the left-hand side, there was a large area where all of the epidermis was scraped off, which is a little odd. So we went out there to do some investigating and see what we could figure out. Um, that photo on the bottom left, those are posts that the golf course put in after we collected the manatees just to prevent any more from going in there. But you can see at low tide, the culvert is almost completely exposed, but at high tide, it's almost completely underwater. So we're looking at this and we found on the Western side of this culvert, there's a piece of PVC sticking up with a piece of rebarb at the bottom. 
that was bent at about a 45 degree angle. So just looking at that, you know, that looks like maybe a manatee could have swam in, got stuck and was pushing against the PVC and the rebar and bent it. Um, however, as we look more at this, a couple of things didn't really add up. One being that this culvert was big enough that both manatees should have been able to swim through with no problem. But the other thing is that the inside of this is covered in small barnacles. And you would think, or I would think if a large manatee was struggling in this culvert, it would have smashed and crushed all of those barnacles, but they were all intact. And we didn't find any barnacles in the skin of the manatee. So we went and looked at the other culvert and you can see this one, again, they put posts in after we recovered the carcasses just for safety reasons. But in that bottom left photo, you can see it's about half filled with dirt. Um, still a very large culvert. But the other interesting thing is that that culvert was a corrugated culvert, meaning it had these ripples in it. And the spacing of those ripples or folds pretty closely matched these bands of scrapes in the, on the adult manatee. The other thing we found was inside, the culvert was partially collapsed. You can see by that red arrow. And that little spot there matches the position of this scraped off region on the manatee side. So it looks like the manatee, this was just a very large manatee that was able to swim into the culvert without much trouble. But when it encountered that partially collapsed area, it got stuck. And because manatees can't back up, it unfortunately ended up drowning. And it seems like the smaller manatee was following behind it. And again, because it couldn't go forward or back, it ended up drowning as well, unfortunately. And then the tide, when it went out, just sucked both of them back out again. So because of this investigation, the golf course um, put a very strong barrier on that um, eastern culvert to make sure no more manatees would go in there just to prevent any future issues. But the culvert that was responsible for the deaths they completely removed that to make sure that that would never happen again. Um, and then a little bit of bonus information. Um, we did a genetics analysis on both manatees and it turns out they were not a mom calf pair. It just happened to be a very large female and a, a large calf that probably had been weaned recently and was just following this other female around. All right, uh, so the next case study, we've got a a uh, very large female, almost 11 feet long, that was fresh when it was found. Um, it was found in this canal down in the, the southeast of Florida. Uh, this is a very long canal that kind of drains part of the Everglades, but it's not really accessible to boats. Um, there's, I think at the very, very far end, there's a water control structure, and there's just really no reason for the boat to be in there much. Um, but this large advantage was dead, so we had to figure out, you know, why in the world did it die in this canal where there shouldn't be any boats? So we get it to the lab, and one of the first things we noticed, um, I apologize, the uh, intestines are exploded out there, but you can see all of these scrapes on the manatee's belly, and among these intestines, there are large blood clots. And the fact that this um, intestine blew out through there was an indication that the muscle may have been weakened in that area as well. So that was kind of unusual. When we look at the, the top of the manatee, you see it's starting to decompose. So it's, you got some patches of white where the epidermis is scraped off. But if you look over here on the far right-hand side, you can see these kind of curved parallel scrapes. And if you look real close, you can see kind of square or rectangular looking marks on it. Very unusual. They uh, kind of superficially resemble watercraft wounds. On the right there is the watercraft wounds. You can see you've got a linear mark from either a skeg or a rudder and then propeller scrapes. So then you know, it looks a little similar. You've got kind of a straight edge and then parallel marks that are kind of a 45 degree angle to it. But those don't really look like watercraft wounds to me. And this is just a drawing of it so you can get a little bit better idea of just how straight those right angles were in the wounds. So we sent uh, staff out to the canal to look around and see what they could find. And about a mile upstream, 
they found there was right there at the red arrow, a bridge reconstruction project. Um, I apologize if these picture quality is, are poor. These were the best we could get from them. But you can see um, they're putting in the, the new pilings and in the background, there's a backhoe sitting on a barge that's dredging the bottom of the canal. See another photo of it there. So we had them pull the, the uh, backhoe over to shore so we could look at it closely. And the bucket had these series of prongs on it for digging into the, the sediment a little easier. And the spacing of those prongs matched pretty well with the spacings of these wounds. Um, a few of them matched exactly. So pretty obviously, that's what caused these wounds on the manatee's back. Um, I'll go back there. So there's massive trauma deep to this region. Um, the manatee's, ma uh, manatee's back had been broken. Um, a lot of internal trauma. And it looks like, unfortunately, the manatee was swimming through the canal right as that backhoe was going in the water, caught the manatee, crushed it, and drug it along the bottom. So um, because of this, we, we went to our management just to make sure that you know, they had all their permits in correctly. And um, I still need to go back and find out exactly what happened to the company. But it seemed like they may not have had all of the proper permits they needed. And it um, was unclear to me whether they actually had a manatee observer on site at the time, which is something that's required for any sort of in-water work like this. Um, so if it turns out that they didn't have an observer or the proper permits, we would shut down the operations immediately. And you know, it could possibly lead to fines since it resulted in the death of a protected species. All right, so the final case study um, is one that I found interesting. We've got, a, again, a very large manatee, 11 and a half feet long, um, discovered on December 17th of last year, floating up against um, the one of the floodgates of the S-80 structure, which is in the uh, southeast of Florida. I kind of show you there, um, Hope Sound there, you can see it in the bottom right corner, Palm City. And then that red circle is where the uh, water control structures are. So you can see it's a series of five floodgates. And then on the right hand side, a large lock. So the manatee was found, um, number 113 there, up against the floodgate, floating. And it had pretty clear uh, water control structure impression wounds on it. You can see 90 degree wounds. Um, internally, it also had signs of uh, being pinned and drowned. So hemorrhage in the neck, uh, wet swollen lungs, which is our sign of drowning most of the time. So pretty clear that the, the structure was responsible. And then uh, about four days later, another manatee was found floating up against the same gate. So you can see again right there, side by side. And it also had signs of impression wounds that are typical of water control structures. That bottom right photo, you can see the two long bands of impression wounds. And then the top photo, that kind of 90 degree right angle wound on the head that continues back. Um, it also had some signs of drowning, but also a little bit more trauma. It had uh, separated vertebrae. Um, some of the, the ribs were dislocated. Um, some shredded tissue, which can be signs of struggling and blood clots in the flipper. Because uh, sometimes the manatee gets stuck in structures, you know, they'll struggle to get out and they'll cause um, tearing and, and blood clots in their muscles. However, when we talk to the um, guys who operate that water control structure, apparently gates two through six had protection screens on them and they verified the all of the screens were intact and were installed properly. And then the other two floodgates did not have screens, but the logs showed that they were not operated at all before the carcasses were found. Also, the protection devices on the lock gates were never, um, never activated and there were no malfunctions or partial closings or anything like that. So it was a little bit of a, a mystery because we've got two animals with clear structure wounds 
but the structure seems to indicate that you know that's not where the manatees died and that's kind of what the structure operators were arguing they were saying well there's no way this was happening at our our structure it must have been somewhere else um well the only other closest structure that i could find was this one that was uh approximately 22 miles away to the west uh this also had a I think four floodgates and a lock, but the first manatee that was found was pretty fresh and it would really be highly unlikely for a manatee to die and float 22 miles downstream and still be in fresh condition because they just don't move that fast with the water flow. Um, and we checked with that, that structure and also we didn't find any indications from the operation logs that that's where the manatees may have died. So I started making plans to take a boat out and just closely inspect this entire river to see if I could figure out, you know, where these manatees may have died from. Um, I still suspected they died at this, the first water control structure, but all the all of the evidence at that point pointed to somewhere else. Well, um, a few months later, they ended up with a dead manatee actually within the lock chamber. Uh, that manatee also had external wounds and internal trauma, um, which was consistent with, with being impinged or sucked up against a partially open gate. But again, the manatee protection devices on the lock doors were not triggered and all of the floodgates seemed to be operating correctly. However, I started doing a bit more research into the, the way this, um, this lock operates and I found that rather than pumping water in and out like some structures do, this particular structure raises and lowers the levels in the chamber by cracking the doors open about one foot and then letting the water flow in or flow out. And those acoustic protection devices turn off when it reaches about one and a half to one foot. So in this sort of case, as you see in the photos, the protection devices would not be active, but that's the prime um, opening amount for manatee to get sucked up and pinged and drowned. And we've actually had manatees or a manatee at another structure die exactly this way. And at another one, we had one almost die, but they were able to get the doors open before the manatee drowned. So it looks like all three of these manatees got sucked up against the door and drowned at this particular you know, block. So it's kind of a, a bit of a vindication for us that we were able to accurately find the cause of death, but we're, we're in the process now of talking to the operators to figure out some other operating procedure to try to prevent any more manatees from dying here. And no more have died up to this point at this structure. Um, hopefully the guys there are keeping a much closer eye on it looking for manatees before they open and close them, you know, that sort of thing. And maybe we'll be able to find some other way to, to do this, either opening the gates a little bit wider or some other procedure, but we're able thankfully to figure out what was going on there. Uh, so I think, yep, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions at all you have about manatees in general or the presentation. So um, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and um, ask the question. I have a question to start. Uh, some point fairly early on in your, in your slides, you had uh, a list of causes and one was dystocia. What is that? Um, so dystocia is a um, an issue with pregnancy. Basically, if you let's see, the best way to explain it: if a manatee has trouble giving birth, like say for instance the calf is too large and it won't fit through the uterus, then the calf dies and the mom will quickly die after that. Um, also, if something happens during the pregnancy and the calf gets stuck part way out for some other reason, then again, that can cause 
a quick death of the mom because it um, stops or restricts the blood flow, uh, that sort of thing. So that's dystocia, just a, an issue with the actual birthing action that results in, in death. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, Brandon for um, all that you do to try to uh, figure out what's killing these poor creatures. Um, in all the list of things that kill manatees, I I didn't see anything about fish carcasses. Do fi do do manatees eat fish carcasses? Do, do they puncture their guts? Is there any? significant mortality from eating fish carcasses? And would they eat fish carcasses? Yep, very good question. Um, yeah, manatees do actually eat fish carcasses. Um, we've got video of it and in some areas it's fairly common. Manatees will come up to the, the docks where people are cutting up their fish and they'll just kind of scavenge all the stuff in the water. Down in the, um, I think it's the Amazon, uh, fishermen actually have manatees come up and pull fish out of their nets or they'll like bite or tear fish in half when they're stuck in the nets. Um, so they'll definitely eat them. Uh, to date, we've never had a manatee that died from um, eating fish that we've found. Uh, in fact, I don't know that we've ever found fish parts in a manatee's stomach. Um, not many of them eat it. And I guess we've just have not been lucky or unlucky enough to found, find one that died right after eating a fish. So it, it does not seem to cause them any issues. Um, well, the reason I ask, and, and you may, I may wanna just talk to you later about this, is we, we've done a lot of work with hooked birds and um, trying to prevent uh, pelicans from becoming entangled or getting food boluses at fish cleaning stations or, you know, where the party captains come in and, 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 you know, fillet their fish and throw the carcasses to the pelicans. We were trying to get, uh, you know, use, um, uh, we call them carcass shoots to put the carcasses in the chute. So the carcass was deposited below the surface of the water. So it did not attract the birds. Um, you know, that, that was um, because at a, at a station where a, a captain comes in with his load of fish, they fill up a wheelbarrow full of carcasses and, and dump them off the end of the pier. So carcasses are still going in the water. water. We were just trying to get some of them um, put in chutes where the birds were a problem. And, and we, we've, we've gone back and forth with fish and wildlife because they said, no, they didn't want the carcass shoots there because the manatees would come in and eat the carcasses and it would, would kill them. And so yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering who, who they were quoting at fish and wildlife, you know, who the resource is at fish and wildlife, who would say something like that, you know, that it didn't kill the manatees, you know, when, the fish carcasses are certainly hurting the birds. And right. Um, anyway, do you have mm. any comment on that, or I can talk to you about it later? But it's just something yeah. we've we've gone on about for quite a while. Yeah, it's um. I would say it, it's an odd comment to make if they are if they were actually saying that it would kill manatees, since we have no evidence of that. Um, I would say sometimes even within the same agencies, different groups don't talk to each other. And so that might've been a group that just assumes it would kill manatees, but has not looked into it. Um, I should have them talk to you. <laughs> yeah, we, we could definitely, um, I mean, you could quote us, uh, I'd do it through email or something like that, so it's more professional, but- um, I certainly will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if you don't have my email address, uh, we can put it up or Anne can send it. Yeah, because we're, we found where we were putting up carcass shoots, the birds just disappeared. You know, if the carcasses were deposited below the surface of the water. And then we just heard yesterday uh, from a pelican group, what were they, what were they saying, Anne, that, that they were, that the fish carcasses were actually contributing to the natural what did they say? Do you remember? Yeah, the, the... that 
um, they were saying that it was just returning the nature, the, the natural product to the sea by putting the parsicas in the water. And I don't think, you know, the point is, um, you know, people have always thrown fish carcasses in, in the water, but, but that always doesn't always mean that that's the best practice. But, but, that, but the real reason that they are not allowing us to install fish carcasses at feeding stations where birds are being attracted to the, to the area. And then when the, when the pelicans and, and these other cormorants and other birds eat the fish carcasses, they're the big bones. And the big bones penetrate the, the mouths or the throats or the stomachs or the intestine of the, of the pelicans um, and cause um, peritonitis in the, and cause the birds to die. And it's something that we really hadn't known was a problem until we started to work on pelican protection. But um, it's something that the wildlife guys um, who, who uh, do the rehab for the birds, they recognize it as being an issue. So if we can get the materials that are being filleted you know, and thrown into the water down below where the pelicans can reach, reach it, then um, we can save a lot of pelicans from dying in that very painful way. I mean, I think all of us who have ever talked to anybody who's had appendicitis, which is the same thing, you know, you hear that that's one of the most, um, it's really very painful. So um, that's, that's something that we're trying to do. So we'll, we'll ask you, if Brandon, if at some point you, you can visit with the uh, Hooked Pelican Working Group about it, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you, that would be great. I wanted to ask. Any more I wanted, questions for Brandon? I did want to ask one other question. They were they were showing uh, the other day on the news um, in, an aerial view of the Manatee Viewing Center that had you know hundreds of manatees in there as they always do. But um, there were also hundreds of bull sharks in the in the um, in that area too. And I've never seen that before. Is that a problem? Will the bull sharks attack manatees? I was just startled to see so many sharks in there with the manatees getting warm. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty normal in that uh, discharge area. There's always in the winter um, spinner sharks and bull sharks and manatees um, coexisting. Uh, there's probably a couple of reasons why they really don't bother the manatees. Uh, one is that the manatee's skin is so thick and so tough. Um, you know, their manatees are related to elephants. They so think about how thick and tough of a hide like an elephant or a rhino might have. It's just not worth it to the shark to try to bite something like that, especially when most manatees are very much larger than the sharks that are in the canal. Um, the other issue or the other reason might be because the sharks are not there to feed. They're just there to warm up because at other power plants where people are allowed to fish and the discharge, you can see hundreds of massive tarpon, but guys can sit there all day and the, the tarpon never take the bait because they're not there to eat. They're just there to recoup and warm up. Um, I will say that uh, on rare occasions, there have been times where sharks have bit, bitten manatees in the canal, but um, <laughs> Generally, that's been animals that are sick or debilitated already, um, and usually the, the bite is on the, the tail where they can actually get their jaw around rather than, like, say, the body. And usually it's just, like, one bite. The shark realizes that's not, not very good and moves on. So, yeah, we, uh, we try not to snorkel in that canal because of all the sharks, but for manatees, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I just want to thank you for your time tonight and for the important work that you do. Um, I was just wondering, um, kind of for the average citizen, what can we do to help with manatee conservation? And are there certain nonprofits or hospitals that you recommend donating time or money to? Um, sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, with FWC. Um, the the FWC's manatee program is funded primarily through 
uh, the sale of manatee license plates. Uh, we don't get any general tax revenue to do the work that we do. Um, so we're very much dependent on the sale of those license plates. Uh, we also have a, a, a way to donate money um, to the Wildlife Foundation of Florida. Uh, that foundation is kind of a, a broad one. So if you donate to that, you have to specifically specify if you want it to go to manatees. And then we can use that to pull out extra money for different things. Um, beyond that, uh, Save the Manatee Club is usually a, a pretty good organization. Um, they help us out with stuff sometimes. Um, they do a lot of work with, um, that's the word, uh, public education, um, as well as a lot of times they'll put pressure on organizations you know, to do things and, and get things done. Um, let's see, places like uh, Zoo Tampa with the, the Manatee Hospital. I don't know how their kind of, kind of switch situation works, but I think they, they should probably take donations. And if you wanted to go to the care of the manatees that they, they receive, you could probably specify that. Um, they've got a very nice hospital there. And I would go probably for uh, some of the others uh, that take care of manatees as well, like the Bishop Aquarium, um, Jacksonville Zoo, places like that. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there's any like really large manatee focused organizations, um, but some counties have uh, groups like Volusia County has a marine mammal stranding team. So you might check with, you know, local area to see if the, a county or a city has something special going on. Um, I will also say that uh, FWC and other organizations also take volunteers. Um, and we have a number of volunteers that help us with manatee carcass recoveries, necropsies, as well as rescues. Um, I know Moat has a rescue team, Clearwater Marine Aquarium has a rescue team, you know, stuff like that. So there's a variety of ways you can get involved. I, I don't know if I rambled on too much there or if all that made sense. That was perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Brandon, um, two things. One is one of the people who was on um, identified herself as a marine biologist, but she, she's from the Bahamas. So you actually had an international audience this evening. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure how she found us, but um, she's had to leave already. I had a, another question thinking about the manatees getting trapped when the lock gates were opening, closing, things like that. Is there, do you know if there's any possibility or any problems with trying to use something like sonics? Uh, can manatees hear well enough that if there were some kind of an underwater noise horn right. that could be sounded before that lock open just a little bit to keep them away would that damage them or would it damage other animals in the area right so so over the years people have tried a, a number of different ways you know to to kind of prevent the, that from happening um we've tried bubble nets i i think they may have tried sounding horns um, things like that that kind of scare the manatees away before they open. And generally what we found is that at first the manatees are spooked by it, but then they realize, oh, that bubble net, that horn means the gates are about to move. So I'm going to go through it really fast and, you know, still maybe get in trouble. They, it's a, turned out to be a, just a, a trigger for them. And some manatees actually like bubble screens, so they'll float around in it and, and have fun. So we're always trying to find something new because those acoustic arrays and the impact arrays, there's really only one vendor for those, um, Hub SeaWorld. And it can cost millions of dollars to install a new system and hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair, upgrade and maintain the systems. And so the structure operators are always on the lookout for something easier, cheaper, and what they've been looking at lately is a side scanning sonar system. So uh, right now, the, for the impact sensors, you know, it's got to hit the manatee or the manatee has got to hit it. And so, you know, we don't like that sort of contact because by the time it hits it, it's almost too late. 
So if they can get the side scanning sonar system to, to work right, it'll detect the manatee before it ever even gets to the floodgate and stop it and open it. Um, I've seen some really promising stuff with it. Um, you can pretty clearly see the manatee shape with the scanning sonar. Um, and it apparently is a lot cheaper. So hopefully, you know, the coming years they'll be able to transit transition away from some of those more expensive older systems. Um, the, some of the original systems were pretty bad. They were uh, like little plungers. And so the, sometimes the plungers would get biofouled and instead of plungering and opening the gate, they would just stab the manatees. So we've at least come a long way from that. So I have a question, Brandon. Um, considering the number of deaths this year, what is the, the population status currently? So um, we've got two things that we do. We have a synoptic survey where we will, on the coldest day of the year, go to as many warm water sites as we can by land, by air, and do a manual count of, and see how many manatees we can count. It's not exact, obviously, because manatees can be anywhere, um, but it gives us a general idea. And then more recently, we've been able to do a, um, a different sort of aerial survey to do a more scientific um, population estimate. And before this past year, the, the last estimate we were able to, to do said that there were somewhere between about 7,500 and 10,000 manatees in Florida, um, which is really nice from what it was you know, a few decades ago. And one of the reasons why the service downlisted them um, um, to threatened rather than endangered now, if we consider, I say there are 10,000 manatees in Florida and a thousand have died so far this year, you know, that's basically 10% of the population, the suspected population, and majority of those are coming from one side of the state. You know, that, that could be a, a real issue, especially since a lot of the animals that are dying over there right now are older reproductive females, whereas in past, die-offs from red tide or cold. It was mostly younger animals, um, juveniles, sub-adults, but the really big reproductive females made it through okay because they knew where the warm water was, they knew where the food was, but they're getting hit pretty hard this time. So we really don't know what the long-term impact is gonna be on that side of the state, especially since, I mean, right now, all the, not all, right now, a lot of the manatees we're seeing at the beginning of winter over there are already thin or emaciated. So you now it's gonna be a real issue going into this fall. Um, you know, seagrass is not gonna regrow itself over the course of a few months. That's gonna take probably years to regrow. And we've got plans in the works for you know, replanting the seagrass, but that's just like gonna take time. So um, it's, for us, it's a worry for sure for that side of the state. Um, I guess one, one way to maybe look at it is that they were able to rebound really well from the really low population state numbers they were at before. So it's very possible um, that they can rebound again from this. It's just something that we're gonna have to manage and try to stem and then help them to repopulate again. Um, it'll be, Interesting. I don't know when we're going to be able to do another aerial survey because right now we're just we got so much else going on. I don't think we're going to be able to do a statewide one for a little longer, but it'll definitely be interesting to see what those numbers show after all of this. And I, I will say as well, just to also keep in mind that in 2010, we had 766 die. 2013, we had 823 die. And in 2018, we had 800 and uh, one of, close to 832, somewhere around there. So they have had a number of really large die-offs, but the population continues to increase. So there's at least that positive side that this, this is catastrophic, but it's not the end of the line for them. They can recover from this, I think. Hopefully I didn't ramble on too long about that. So you made me you made me think of another question. Um, 
and it has to do with, you know, so many of the die-offs recently have been on the East Coast. What are the factors that are mostly affecting the birds on our, I mean, the manatees on our side of the world? Um, red tide is a, a pretty big one from time to time. Um, it generally has mostly just affected the southwest portion of the state, kind of uh, Manatee County down um, through Collier County. Uh, that's really the, the big reoccurring one. Manatees kind of in the northwest, the Crystal River area, um, and going into Tampa Bay. I guess probably boat strikes are the, the biggest issue for them. Um, but those animals have pretty good warm water sites, plenty of food. Um, up until this year, red tide really hasn't been a big issue in Pinellas, Hillsboro. Um, it got a, to be a bit of an issue this year because it got so widespread. Um, but yeah, I would say probably red tide is the biggest natural problem for them right now. Somebody else had a question and I think I spoke over them. Brandon, I, yeah, I was going to read this question came in um, through the chat box. This uh, Ray is wondering if manatees might be helpful against invasive plant species, whether they have a giant appetite and whether there might be additional ecological significance for the manatee. Yeah, that's a, that's a really difficult question to answer because manatees will eat just about anything that's in the water. So if they're, you know, and there's invasive species in different parts of the state. I think uh, there's been issues up in Crystal River with a lot of invasive um, aquatic plants and manatees will eat it for sure. Um, I, I, think, I think we would prefer to just have them eating natural stuff because all the invasive species you know, it can cause so many other problems. It can outcompete natural seagrasses and things like that. It can, invasive species can clog canals. But you know, as far as I think it's been suggested in the past that manatees could help um, you know, clear out canals of that sort of stuff. But I don't I don't think we can rely on that. Their population is not big enough and and we don't want to rely on on them just to eat it all. We want to stem the issue that's causing it, if we can. Um, so yeah, it's, I hesitate to say too much about it just because it's, it can be a really hot political topic and it's difficult to say too much about it, really. There needs to be a lot more research to it. Um, although I, I will say just as a funny little story, um, so there have been groups in Florida that have claimed that manatees are invasive species, um, have claimed that back in uh, you know, maybe 17, 1800s, um, the Spanish went down to South America, captured manatees and brought them back to Florida to control vegetation in the canals, um, which is pretty funny for anybody who actually you know, knows manatee biology and life history. There's no way anybody in large sailing ships in the olden days could capture manatees in large enough numbers to bring up here just to clear out, um, you know, invasive water species of, of plants. But that's a funny little story that keeps popping up from time to time in different groups. A little bit of a conspiracy theory there for you. Thank you so much for uh, debunking that. Yeah, that's uh, really a lot of fun facts to know. And I guess our like conservation efforts really sets mm -hmm. a, a nice foundation for anything else that follows. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you so another, much. another question came in in the chat. Do they eat water hyacinth? Um, oh, do they do they eat water hyacinth? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, they definitely will eat that if it's available. Yeah, and there have been some suggestions that we uh, collect that and try to feed it to the manatees in the Indian River Lagoon, but um, I I don't think anybody really wants to start putting more invasive species in in more areas. <laughs> Share it around. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brandon, and thank everybody for, for joining in. This was obviously a very engaging and, and uh, important topic. 
And we really appreciate your presentation. Yep, no problem. Yes, all, all kinds of thanks coming in on the chat. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So we appreciate it. Yep, no problem. If, we, if anybody we has any other questions, feel free to email me. Yeah, and I did put your email in the chat. So uh, if anybody wants it, it's there. And we did we did record this so it'll be on the website. People can go and uh, watch it again. Well, thank you so much.